mercy and peace to each of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. It's great to see everybody today. If you're visiting with us today, we're especially glad you're here. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. You should be able to find a clipboard or a little card on there, and you can give us a little information about yourself, and we'd love to know that you are with us today in worship. A couple of announcements as we get started. I want to first say thanks for all the cards and text messages and emails and all the things that you've done for us and my family in the last couple of weeks. Very much appreciated. Paul is doing well, as well as can be expected after surgery. And uh, we are very grateful to the congregation for all the love and prayers. I want to say thanks also to those that were elected to the nominating committee last Sunday. Please pray for them. And I'm sure they would be happy to hear any ideas you might have about who our next class of elders might be. So that's in the newsletter if you need more information about that. We Fun and Play School has Wednesday and Friday spots available. So you can see Anna is Anna in here right now. See Anna if you would uh, like to sign up for that. And we have several items in the back for lost and found. So if you're missing something that you left the church, it's probably in this room right back there on the table. You can go back there and claim those things. Those are the announcements I have. What other announcements do we have? Yes, ma'am. This is our card and gift to Paula and the family. Oh, thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Margie. Anybody else? Yes.
please stand for our call to order. From Psalm 100. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. For the Lord is the gracious God, whose mercy is everlasting, and whose faithfulness endures to all generations. Our opening hymn of praise is number 48. <laughs>
more often than not, we're going to stop the game. <laughs> and so he developed a way of batting. You know how your coach has told you to bat like that, right? Well, John Harris, he had developed a, a habit of batting like that, downward, so that if the ball came, his bat would kind of hit it on the back bottom side, and it would go down toward the ground rather than up in the air, okay? And so that was his way of hitting the ball. And I suppose his parents and his older sister called him John. But everyone else that I know ended up calling him Chocolate Harris. <laughs> because the way he hit the swung the bat, it was kind of like he was chopping wood, you know? And so he got a nickname, Chocolate Harris. exceptionally good baseball players. And I have to tell you that I was probably the least exceptional player at all, which is a nice way of saying I was the worst player at all. And one of the reasons for that is that when I, I inherited a bunch of allergies from my dad's side of the family. So in the springtime, when the in Pennsylvania, when the trees are starting to put out leaves and the grass is starting to grow and the flowers are starting to come out of the ground, there was a lot of pollen in the air. And so when other kids were able to be out playing baseball and practicing with the batting, I was sitting on the swing on the front porch reading comic books because my allergies, if I got too excited to write exercise too much, I would get asthma and I had trouble breathing. I, I couldn't my chest cut off, I couldn't breathe. I mean, they have, they have inhalers now for that stuff, but when I was a kid, there was no sense in an inhaler for that So I didn't get much practice playing baseball. And then in the fall, there was ragweed and golden rod. There was more pollen in the air. And so I had very limited opportunities to exercise and play. I spent a lot of time reading. I love to read. So one day, my mom, I guess she got thought I was reading too many comic books. She came out and sat on the swing. And she said, Bruce, would you like to take piano lessons? See, my mom was a good piano player. And I could always, I could already play chopsticks. You know chopsticks? As your aunt Susan's like, how about the, how about the knuckle? You know the knuckle song? How about I love coffee, I love tea, I love the girls and the girls, you know that song? <laughs> well, I'll teach that at the church. <laughs> so anyway, my mom, but she couldn't teach me. My mom, believe it or not, my mom taught herself to play the piano. I don't know how she did that. I don't know how she got to translate the lines on, this, on the music to the keys on the, on the piano. But she was really good. She could play classical music as well as hymns and stuff like that. So anyway, I decided I would take piano lessons. I took piano lessons for about 10 years. And you know I still play the piano here, right? Well, it took me about 30 years to realize this lesson I was learning this what I was sure. You know those guys that were better at me in playing baseball? By the time they were 40 or 45, they weren't able to play baseball anymore. They couldn't run fast enough on them. And if they did run fast, they might fall and break a bone. <laughs> and so they were good at playing baseball in their youth, but this, the talent of playing baseball didn't last them for years and years and years. Whereas my talent, I guess you call it, of playing piano, I still enjoy at almost 86 years old. And so the talent that I have, that I develop because my mom suggested Scott Gordon play baseball, is giving me a lot of pleasure now. And that's something I think that we need to be aware of. We all have different talents. We all have different skills. And it's good. It's, I'm glad that some people are good at baseball. I'm glad that some people are good at playing the piano. I'm glad that some people are good at fixing cars, because I couldn't begin to do that. 
I'm glad that some people are good at preaching, because I couldn't do that. But this is part of what the Bible tells us too. When the Bible tells us that we all have different talents and different skills, all different parts of the body, that's in First Corinthians, by the way. So the Bible tells us something about everything in life. But in First Corinthians, it tells us that we all have different skills, all different talents, and we all come together to make one thing. And the way it talks in the Bible, it says, is the eye better than the nose? Is the nose better than the ears? But you know, if, you, if, you, if your nose was an eye, you probably could see really good, but you couldn't smell anything. If your nose was an ear, you'd really hear really well. But if your nose, you know, you, you know what I'm saying, right? We need all parts of the body, we need all skills that they're going to make the world go right. And that's the lesson I want you to learn today. Is, and I'm not saying that God gave me asthma so I could play the piano. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that out of something like that, something, God made something good happen for me in my life. And that's the lesson, too. You know, if we, if we have to look hard enough, we'll find if we have something, some, something, uh, what do I want to say? Something in our life that's not good, we can eventually find that something good came out of that. And that's what I'm saying here. With my allergies and my asthma, because of that, I learned to play the piano, which gave me a lot of pleasure. <laughs> Let's say God, thank you for everyone who has talents, different talents. We appreciate that because it's what makes the world go around. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bruce also has a talent for telling stories and remembering all those memes. Friends, would you stand and let us sing our hymn of preparation, number 101.
for all the blessings that this day represents to us, the opportunity to gather with friends and family and worship, the opportunity to gather around your word. So we pray that your spirit would descend upon us again in these moments, show us what we need to know and how we are to live. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Responsive reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter, verses 28 to 31. Jesus says, When a fig tree learn its lesson, as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Yeah, series. In fact, you might sit back and get comfortable because our reading today is all of chapter 3. Listen for God's word for you today. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, and the governors the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and continue the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down in worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. 
They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times more than was customary, and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that were thrown bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies, rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language, that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this one might be pretty close to home for a couple of you. The School of Agriculture's Dean of Admissions was interviewing a prospective student. Why have you chosen this career as a farmer, he asked. I dream of making a million dollars in farming like my father, the student replied. Your father made a million dollars in farming, echoed the dean, very much impressed. No, replied the applicant, but he always dreamed of it. <laughs> Time to use our imaginations this morning, I guess to dream of it, maybe, so to speak. I want you to imagine for a few minutes that your family are Jews living in occupied territory. For almost all of the history of the Jewish people, the nation of God's people have been conquered and living in captivity under a foreign army. So imagine moving through your day, trying not to be noticed. From your earliest memories, your parents have told you, don't call attention to yourselves. You don't want the soldiers to notice you. That's how you get jailed or worse. So you quietly move through the marketplace without making eye contact with any. Excuse me, sir. As you wish, ma'am. You 
quickly gather whatever supplies you might need and errands that have to be done and done quickly and with efficiency so that you can return to the relative safety of your home. Every day you think, if I can just get back to my side of the village, to my neighborhood, then everything will be okay. But until then, watch out. It reminds me, we watched the movie The Help a couple of weeks ago, and in that movie you might remember that all of the house help get on the bus at the end of the day to return to their neighborhood, to their side of town, which was away from segregated Mississippi. At the end of the day, with God's grace, all of your family have returned home. The men who left early in the day in the dark, the fields have returned home in the dark, again, so as not to be noticed. And women have turned their trip to the marketplace into an evening meal, and your family has gathered around the table. You lock the door, join hands, bow your heads, and offer a prayer. Baruch, Atai Adonai, Ochenu, Melech HaOlam, Borei, Ve'i Ha'az. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the tree. And then it's time to enjoy the peace of the meal together. For a few moments in an otherwise pretty anxious and dangerous day, as occupied people living in a foreign land, you were able to enjoy Shalom. It's the highlight of your whole day, those few moments. After that meal, when the family is reclined and thinking about rest, probably one of the children suddenly comes to life. Father, tell us a story. Remember, these are the days before television and radio. There are no newspapers or books to read. And so the way that people spent their leisure time was by telling stories. Which one do you want, says the father, or maybe the grandfather? Hmm, I know. Tell us the one about the fiery furnace. That's a good one. The fiery furnace story. And using the ancient oral tradition, one of the elders in the house would then share the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were our Jewish ancestors living under the authority of old Nebuchadnezzar, says the storyteller. They were the ones that old rascal king forced to change their names. No longer would they go by their birth names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. All of these names were Jewish names that referred to God, such as God is gracious in the case of Hananiah, or who is like God in the case of Mishael, or God keeps him, which is what Azariah means. Nebuchadnezzar said, from now on, you will be called the names substituted with references to the Babylonian gods, such as Nebo. Abednego means servant of Nebo. The ancient kings would often try to eliminate any references to their conquered people's fate and life, simply assimilate them and take everything away from them that they could. So old Nebuchadnezzar erected a golden idol and forced everyone to worship it. Over and over we read in the story today in scripture these, these silly references to the old king. Notice that the way the story is told is almost this sing songy over exaggeration of the details over and over again. King Nebuchadnezzar sent to the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the councilors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the councilors, the treasurers, the justices, and the magistrates all came. Repeating the same wording over and over again is an ancient technique of storytelling that makes the king seem childish and silly, almost as if he couldn't remember the details and had to have them repeated over and over to him, again and again. Notice the same thing happens with the musical instruments. The gist of the story is that Nebuchadnezzar, a great and ancient king, was surely overmatched by the three faithful men and their god who was about to act. Imagine the children leaning in with eyes wide as the elder storyteller in the family gets to the heart of the story in which the three men are thrown into the fiery furnace. Meshach and Abednego were thrown into the fire that's so hot that the guards that bound them are instantly consumed. But when the official of the king's court looks, one says, I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has an appearance of a god. And in the end of the story, even the old crazy king falls down to worship our god because he's 
faithful to God in all things. And those that are faithful to God in all things cannot be harmed. See, in the ancient world, these stories were the compass that guided life and times. These stories that are told at the table from one generation to the next are the stories that help them live and survive. We can stand with God with faith in our fiery furnace because of what happened in the story of Daniel. Throughout the history, our history as a people, the story of Daniel in particular has been beloved, especially by people living in the harshest of conditions. Daniel is a beloved story to this day in the black church, for example, because of its relevance to the struggle of slaves trying to survive life in bondage to their masters. The same Christian masters taught slaves the stories of the Bible, perhaps not always realizing how those very stories can inspire enslaved people to continue to strive for freedom for themselves and for their families. Imagine a family of enslaved African people gathered around the fireplace of a slave hut somewhere in Alabama or South Carolina. Mama, tell us the story of the fiery furnace again. The message is, hang in there and be faithful, because God is with you no matter what. Perhaps the question for us today, for us, is how do we hear the story of Daniel? Because we're not, thanks be to God, a people living in bondage or under occupied armies. We're free people, free to worship God as we like, free to come and go and do what we want. Most of us have all the things we need and most of the things we want. Can we even hear a story like Daniel, at least in the way it was understood by ancient people? An ancient story about power, power of faith, fiery furnace, a guiding message to stay faithful no matter what befalls you or what happens to you. It's different, not easier or harder, but different for us. When struggle is so readily identified as an occupied army or a crazy king, then maybe it's easy to understand the threat to faith in life. But maybe the threat to our faith is not so easily understood. I read an article this past week written by Jake Metter in the Atlantic, in which he identifies the reason that so many churches and faith communities seem to be struggling to survive in our day and time. He writes, quote, Contemporary America simply isn't set up to promote mutuality, care, or common life. Rather, it is designed to maximize individual accomplishment as defined by professional and financial success. Such a system leaves precious little time or energy for forms of community that don't contribute to one's own professional life. As one ages, the professional prospects of one's children, Meta writes, workism reigns in America. And because of it, community in America, religious community included, is a math problem that just doesn't add up. Our threat is perhaps not a foreign army. We're not people living in captivity. We're not the diaspora. Sometimes Christian people argue that we are just that, a remnant of God's faithful people living like the Jews overly hostile world, but I'm not convinced that it's so overt. Rather, I might agree with Meta that perhaps American life itself has evolved into something that no longer promotes church life and Christian faith in the same way that it once did. Life in the 21st century is generally more like a fiery furnace, different than it perhaps was for God's people. And yet I believe that the message a story like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego still holds. Stay faithful to what you believe. God is good. Life is good. God will be with you in all things, even when the world around you is different and evolving into something else. Could there be anything more important in our age of division and loneliness and despair? As we say it all the time, that a community of God's people who stay together, who continue to worship God, who tell ancient stories of God's faithfulness, over and over again. As we gather here, we continue to tell these stories. Our family of God gathers together and we dream dreams of faithful people, same dreams that people have dreamed for generations. We rest here, we recline around this table, and our young people and others come to life and ask us, what does it mean to be a faithful person? Tell us a story. 
tell us the story of faith in the fiery furnace. That one that helps us remember who we are and whose we are. Just one of the stories of God's people that we've told for generations and generations. The ones that we pass, as we pass the faith along. The ones that guide us always back to the one who loves us and promises us life, even life eternal. We're grateful for these stories. Thanks be to God. retold the story of God's faithfulness again when you join me to kneel before God's throne of mercy and offer prayer. <laughs> history that we share with all those that have called upon your name for generations of faithfulness. Long and faithful to your people in spite of our waywardness, God. You sent Jesus our Lord who stood in the fiery furnace of the cross in order to save us. We know that we are able to live freely in the faith today because, only because of all that you have done for us. We give you our thanks. Pray for the world around us, for all in our families and neighborhoods and communities who are lonely, anxious, or desperate. Fill us, God, with such faith in you that others might be lifted from what ails them through our weakness. Grant us a peace that surpasses understanding. Continue to unite us in faith in this community, a world that seems no longer interested in such a community as ours sometimes continue our resolve to stay together, to care together, to minister to one another. We pray for all that are ill or recovering from surgery, for those that have lost loved ones, for those that are living without the basic resources of life, food, shelter, clothing, a decent job, child care for our families, medicine, Retirement. There are so many things we need. And we believe, God, that you care for each one of us in such ways. Bless us and those we love with all we need. We pray for all those also in the world living in the midst of war and terror, for people in the Middle East, in Russia and Ukraine, in South Sudan. We pray that you would bring peace to our world, O oh Lord. The only way that peace can truly come is through you and your ways. We promise to continue to tell your story and to do our best to live as your people. We pray today using the words that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory of forever. Amen. Continue our worship now with bringing forward of our tithes and our offerings.
again, we give you thanks for all the blessings that we enjoy. And so as part of our worship, we return some of the gifts that you've given to us and ask that you bless others with this. Send these gifts out to witness, to you, to faith, to community, and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you remain standing and join me as we affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand. announcement I failed to make at the beginning. The session meets today following worship, and so if you have been visiting with us for a while and you'd like to make it official and be a part of this community, the session meeting is the time when we always receive new members, and we would love to have you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord always look upon you with favor and give you peace.